fuse it. Okay, is this satisfactory? Okay, so, um, right, so the, um, The plan is to spend the rest, most of today, finishing up uh, the discussion of the Anderson 58 paper and doing things with one-dimensional localization. Um, and again, the, the spirit here is to give a um, flavor of how localization is profoundly different from much of the rest of the standard by now condensed matter physics, where um, you know, field theoretical type ideas of, you know, saddle points and mean fields, they need to be updated or entirely revised. And so, you know, I purposely focused yesterday's lecture and today, but we all focused on uh, probability distributions and thinking probabilistically about what um, we're interested in. So, and so then, so towards the end of the day, hopefully, I will start delivering on the promised subject, which was made by localization. And again, I will make use of, um, as, as the co-authors of this paper, um, this is by Scoil and Altschuler, I'll make use of the Anderson technology, and finally, I think tomorrow we'll talk and be all beyond perturbation theory, which is to say numerics. Tomorrow. Okay. And a, a couple of you have asked about the notes. Uh, I will uh, distribute some version of these notes, and uh, so I should say that I'm following. Um, some possibly private notes by Dennis Basco, and I, I have, I've asked him for permission to distribute his notes, but I haven't heard back. Maybe Dennis lets me share them, or I'll have to distribute them. Um, all right, so just very quickly, since things got uh, a bit, actually, I should find out when I'm supposed to quit. When am I supposed to stop? 2.45. 2.45, thank you. I ran over yesterday, I think almost all of the speakers. All right. This chunk is too small. So what's the idea? We have simple looking Hamiltonians. Incidentally, as a cultural comment, uh, uh, one of the sort of more profound, even more profound than localization contributions of uh, Anderson was to do away with complicated Hamiltonians and uh, to advocate use of simple-minded models or simple, simple to state models that don't involve atomic wave functions and SP, D wave sort of uh, approximations and just especially lattice models. So that's somehow, I mean, I think even that one might have been controversial at the time. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so this is the Hamiltonian. This is the pictorial representation. This is space. Right? And we've got some orbitals. We have energies. And we want to consider a particle, a quantum particle hopping. And uh, I think the, the, the key sort of a uh, um, aspect of the localization problem is that there are always detuning, you might call them, or just energy denominators if you're doing perturbation theory in the sense that if you have a particle, if you have an eigenstate localized here in the absence of hopping, that, that's an eigenstate. As you turn on hopping, this eigenstate in perturbation theory is dressed 
if it becomes a linear superposition of multiple sites, there's some denominator there, dot dot dot, plus minus one, plus t squared over delta squared, plus minus two, okay, and so on. And you should imagine that plus minus one, two, three, is a generalized label that can be in three dimensions, in seven dimensions, whatever you like. And I think the, the basic thing that I wanted to uh, uh, um, emphasize last time is that if you think from the perturbative point of view, it's not even clear um, that this series can actually start producing for you propagation. Right? And I think the, 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 the way, at least my, my reading of the, uh, um, of the argument, of the reasoning, is to sort of formulate a null hypothesis, a hypothesis that this never gives you delocalization, and then see how that breaks down. Yeah. So delta is Em minus Em prime. Okay, so delta, sorry, these are deltas. These are the energy denominators. So every time you make a hop, um, there's an energy denominator. But it's and not always going to be the same. Result. No, it's not going to be the same. I'm sorry. I just, I, I'm, I'm being sloppy and right, right. right. So the point is that you, you know, for example, you could put on an electric field. You could do this. And then you, so that's a star, you know, you'll get a star ladder. There, you, you can actually work out, so this is the, the, the lattice version of the area functions or whatever. Right? You can work out and you can see that these things are never localized. And so here the idea, the notion is that as you turn up the strength of hopping T, or you turn down these deltas, at some point the structure of the solution will change profoundly, just qualitatively will change. I think that's what we're fishing for. Okay. Just to set, uh, remind you how the formalism was set up, is that we'll look at the uh, matrix elements of the resolvent. Oops, I, I may start uh, screwing up. Sorry, I know there's a shadow, so I'm supposed to do this. Um, MM prime, and so we, we have to do the infinitesimal. And so by looking at diagonal terms in this sort of basis, we're essentially asking about return of quantum particle, also known as quantum wave, of course, to the R to where it's going. So that, that's just to qualitatively motivate why this is the right thing to think about localization. Now, if you think of the of this object in, in the time domain, of course, you know that if it's, you know, if you chop this uh, 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 perturbative expansion in some finite order, you're going to get just oscillatory contributions that never decay, right? And so the idea here is that you want to get to a situation where everything here matters, and so you get a decay. All right, and so just to finish summarizing where we left last time, so if we introduce formally the self-energy, so that's a pretty standard idea of reshaping green functions in terms of self-energies, um, then what you know is that in perturbation, if perturbation theory is convergent, it's convergent, in other words, the wave functions more or less look like this, then sigma is real, right? what you're basically computing, you know, if you still remember your undergraduate quantum mechanics, you're basically computing perturbatively all of the shifts of the energy levels and the um, uh, hybridization of different localizer states. Um, and so, right, so the idea is to ask how can we develop an imaginary part in sigma um, and in particular, the, we spent some time sort of qualitatively discussing the physics of this mathematical sort of a, a crutch of introducing an infinitesimal. And the idea is that, you know, by introducing this infinitesimal into the 
uh, uh, into a quantum system, you are by hand introducing effectively a rate of partial loss from the quantum system. And the point is that if you're actually looking at a diagonal term in the, in the green function, you are trying to measure the rate of particle loss from that site. So the rate of particle loss introduced extrinsically in the way it's seeding the seeding or not the rate of particle loss that's intrinsic to the uh, quantum dynamics. And so the idea, the, uh, the formulation that, um, um, that is natural is to actually consider the perturbative expansion for the green function or for the self-energy and expand it in, um, I think I called it big gamma. So the idea was to expand it in, again? Thank you, Matt. Whoops, yes, I already said thank you. All right, so the idea is that um, the only way for the imaginary part to be finite is for this coefficient of uh, naive Taylor series and eta to diverge. This does not address the metallic behavior, in other words, the non-localized behavior. Uh, and so we spent some time discussing what the imaginary part of sigma should be in the metallic, for metallic states. I'm not going to go back there unless there's Question, this is just a question of when uh, the, this localized perturbative behavior breaks down. Okay. All right. So, let me, I think this is almost essentially where I left. Um, so what are these? What is the subject? The, roughly speaking, here's the site where we would like things to remain localized. We draw paths that may have loops in them, may have, you know, smiley faces or whatnot. And these paths can have, uh, uh, so this is a path squared. So these are actually loops that begin and end on that side. But by defining a square, we can just talk about paths that leave the side and never come back. But the idea is that they, Anyway, um, so the point is that there are, there's a total, uh, the number of these paths is huge. It scales exponentially, where this is, uh, depends on the lattice, depends on the dimensionality. So for 3D cubic, K is equal to 4.5, approximately. I've been meaning to look up how to compute these Ks. Analytically, I, I haven't. <laughs> found an easy reference yet, so I, maybe tomorrow. Um, right, and then the idea is that, so in order to be able to um, study this object, we need to, um, we computed last time the probability of having a very long path, sorry, the probability for having an amplitude uh, uh, of, for a path, a probability distribu a distribution for an amplitude of length of a, of a path amplitude length n, and uh, in other words, it's an integral for non-intersecting non paths. That's important. So little v is the rescaled disorder um, strength. A, I, I'm, you know, we got as far as this yesterday. I can fill in some of the. I can repeat some of the steps if you need them to, but I would prefer just to start with this and finish off the discussion, okay? <clears throat> so this promises you that there are many, many paths of that length, small n, and naively you might think that central limit theorem might save you and you could just, uh, um, uh, you know, approximate the distribution of the sum of these paths. Um, uh, in some central limiting fashion, but this distribution has uh, uh, um, uh, fat tails. You see as n goes to infinity, there's a log infinity a divided by a squared, so that's a fat tail. So the, 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 then the idea is that the sum of a n prob <coughs> to n, 
So this probability distribution, if you have a fat tail, uh, this probability distribution is well approximated by, by the largest value. And um, I think the very last thing that I, um, and this can be estimated as a derivative. This has a name. I forgot what the name is in uh, probability theory. The um, something statistic. Oh, sorry. I should have. It's basically one of these extreme value sort of ideas. OK. All right. So now our task is to compute this integral of that object, and it's sort of a fun integral. Um, it takes about a page. I'm not sure. It's, it's the kind of thing that I enjoy. <laughs> but, uh, I, well, OK, let, let me just uh, highlight some steps. Uh, it's interesting the way the integral is, the behavior of the integral, how it's um, not, yeah, can be non-convergent. It's sort of, yeah, let me do the integral. So we need, a, we, need, we need this integral. So far, it's a couple. You know this calculation, right, Chris? No, I'm talking to Chris. No, okay. Forward approximation. No, you'll be there. No, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I think nowadays. So this is one. Of, so the idea of looking at non-intersecting paths and uh, trying to argue for stability um, is something that has been um, used um, quite a bit recently. It's called the forward approximation. So I think I'm, what I'm doing is essentially uh, the details of that in this particular context. Although, again, I'm not 100% sure about the notation. But anyway, this is the integral that needs to be done. And <clears throat> so there are various obvious things that one can do. First of all, switching variables back to the exponential variables. Expo sorry. So this is sort of a u always a useful trick when you have logarithms floating around. All right, so we're going to switch variable to this variable lambda, which is essentially logarithm of a. <clears throat> so a now becomes a constant. Um, right, so the idea is to replace this lower limit with 0 to infinity. That's a much nicer. Um, you know what? I think I should just copy from the limit because otherwise things will start disappearing. So this becomes minus 1 minus lambda. Then there's log n minus 1, a e lambda v n. OK. Now, um, so this is nice. Right? d lambda e minus lambda from 0 to infinity, this is you know, one of the most sort of common integrals. And so what we need to do is we need to turn this into a power series. Because once it's a power series, these integrals are easy. Where I need a pole. <laughs> Give me a pole. Which residue? Maybe? I, I don't know. Got e oh, yeah, you're right there. No, no, no. This is, <laughs> there are too many things going on here. So let's, uh, let, actually, let, let me simplify this by itself. Um, so this.